All right. So welcome to Janu January. Wow. 23rd, 2111 upgrades. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about just kind of like the big features that we think everyone should know about. We do have additional blog posts that Sarah has been posting into the chat um, where you can see all of the other features that are in here. But these are the ones that we think everyone kind of really needs to know about um, to make sure you have um, all the information about that. My name is Donna Bachowski, and I'm one of the educators here at Bywater Solutions, and I am in Northern Kentucky. Sarah, how about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Brown. I am in Baltimore. I'm also an educator with Bywater. Um, pass it on to Kelly. Hi, y'all. My name is Kelly McGilligott. I've been dragged back to education to assist with the upgrade <laughs> webinars. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> And I'm happy to talk to you about 2111. And I'm located in the best state in the country, the state of Maine. And I'm Heba Amin Headley. Um, I'm on implementation support. So I float between support, education, and uh, the data team. I do a lot of tickets. That's You've probably seen my name on a ticket or two, especially if you've done report stuff. And I am in Kansas, which it's Kansas. <laughs> But what is happening in Kansas in September that we're all excited about? OHA US is happening in Lawrence in September. And if you haven't been, Lawrence is just a fun little college town. It is, it is a bright spot. Yeah, COHA US and COHA Con will be combined forces and will be there middle of September. We should put that link in just in case people want to. And Koha Con is the International Koha Conference. Um, it is an amazing opportunity to meet folks that use Koha from all over the world. Um, so it's a great opportunity to, to be able to do that. It only comes, um, it's only here in the US every few years. Um, it rotates from continent to continent. So it'll be a few more years before it comes back to um, the North American continent. Um, but definitely, if you get a chance, um, go ahead and visit. Oh, Barbara's here. There we go. I knew someone would have that link there. <laughs> Welcome, Barbara. You beat me to it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, the big question that we get is when our upgrade is going to be happening. If you have a test server, then we are working on your um, up, uh, updates already. So you may already have that pushed. For everyone else, we are starting to push the notifications out to your sites, to your staff interfaces um, that will let you know when you're being upgraded. Um, we are gonna be starting those, and I always get the date wrong, mid-July, is that correct? I believe it was July 18th, although... Yeah, so mid July, we'll just go with mid July. Um, so but that's when everyone what that's when the big upgrades going to start and everyone's going to go ahead and get these upgrades pushed to them. Um, so remember with um, Koha, there's not a lot that you have to do with the upgrades. Really, what it comes down to is making sure that you clear your cache the morning after the upgrade. So that's all there is to it. Um, so easy peasy. And let's go ahead and jump on in. So we are going to start with OPAC, right? Yes. All right, get my screen shared. Is this showing up for everybody? Okay, great. All right, um, so a couple of um, changes for the OPAC um, that will just make some things um, easier that used to require some special code. Um, and then we've also got an enhancement that carries over a change that was made to the staff interface um, in 2105. So the first one is 27360. Uh, library should be able to pick which branches display on the library's page of the OPAC. So that is uh, for right here. Um, when there is a link to all the different branches of a library, um, there is a new option in your library's administration. So here in administration and then libraries. Um, there is a new option for whether or not a branch is public. Um, so if we go here into the West branch, for instance, 
we've got this new option right here. Um, it has, it's entirely separate from being a pip, uh, pickup location, so it's not going to affect that. Um, so we've got here, you can see here that we've got our four branches, only one of them is not public, but all of them are pickup locations. And back here on the OPAC, you can see that they do not all, uh, the West branch is not showing here. It does still show here as a branch that you can search. And if I go to place a hold, it will still be a pickup location. Um, so that is just um, a simpler way to be able to edit, uh, adjust what is showing there than having to add some special code. Um, the next one that we've got is uh, 28180. Um, which is using a lightbox gallery to display images on the detail pages of the OPAC. Um, and so this is a continuation of work that was done in 2105 um, on the staff interface, where this multiple cover image um, option um, began so that for one bib, you can click through these dots to see multiple images. Um, but with 2105, that was not yet part of the OPAC. Um, but now, if we hop on over here, we can do the same thing. Um, and so this can be either multiple image sources in your enhanced content system preferences, or like for this example, we've got a local cover image. Um, so it can be any combination of those. It can be more than two. I've just got two showing here, um, but this is a nice way to be able to highlight multiple covers um, so that the display is the same as you've got on the staff interface. Um, now we've got that in the OPEC. Um, and the third one um, is 24223 and 24224, uh, convert OPEC nav and OPEC nav bottom system preferences to the news block. Um, this one is actually uh, tied to one that Kelly will be covering in technical services. So I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on that one now. So that one is coming up later. Um, any questions about these couple of um, enhancements though? All right. In that case, I will. Awesome. So one of the things about this enhance about this upgrade, and we get these every once in a while, um, is that we don't have any major workflow changes in this um, upgrade. Um, there's no huge new features, things like that. What it is is a collection of very lovely small enhancements. Um, so these are all those little things that make us happy. And that's one of the things that I know Kelly and I have always kind of joked about is that it doesn't have to be fancy to make us happy. Um, and that's what it is, is this, this upgrade very much is a lot of smaller um, enhancements with the exception of article request. Um, we only have one or two partners that use article requests, so we're not really talking about that, but there have been some incredible enhancements to the article request process. So if that is something that you've maybe been interested in and haven't used before, let us know. We'd be more than happy to sit down and go through that with you and show you all of the really cool things that you can do with it now. So, um, but anyways, lots and lots of little things that we absolutely love. So, and that's what my section is gonna be on is, um, uh, goodness. What am I talking about? <laughs> um, all of the patrons and circulation sorts of elements. So um, again, all these little things that just make our lives so much better um, when we're doing things on the front line. So the first one is bug 10902. Um, and this is highlighting patrons from the logged in library in your patron searches. So this is really fantastic if you've got multiple locations, a lot of patrons want to be able to kind of find an easier way to identify who, you know, what patrons you're looking for. So if I come into the search patrons button and I'm going to go ahead and just type in the first couple of characters, you'll notice now that in my drop down, you can see the patrons that are matched at my location. So I'm logged into the North branch. So you can see that Marge is highlighted in green. The other people with a similar name are in gray. So it does designate not only their branch, but it highlights which ones you're looking for. That is in both the search patrons and the checkout. So again, that functionality is going to be there for both of those. And then when you come into your patron section again, 
same thing. And then when I do my full search, again, it is going to highlight in green um, the ones that I am looking, the, the patrons that are my, that match my location. So again, nice little functionality makes it a little bit easier to kind of figure out people and, and look for the ones that you're looking for. Um, I will say quite a few of these. We have Monday Minutes on. Uh, the amazing Kelly um, and Jesse have done a number of Monday Minutes on these upgrades. So they've got their very enjoyable uh, <laughs> sessions about that. So Amy, I got to tell you, um, I don't know what Springfield it actually came down to. We, I had a, uh, a spirited discussion with the library I was changing about a month ago, uh, training about a month ago about this. Um, they're claiming they're out west. I thought they were Midwest. I don't know. So <laughs> we'll just leave them wherever they are, wherever they are. So. Donna, the good news is, is there, there's probably a Springfield in every state. So everyone can claim Simpsons as their own. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, again, another nice little functionality in your patron record. You now have under the edit section, coming down to the contact information field, look at this main contact method. I'm going to pause for just a second. Isn't that exciting, y'all? So now I can go ahead and indicate for my patron, what that main way to contact them should be. So do they want to get phone calls? Do they want to do whatever? Um, this drop down is generated off of the options that I have showing here in that contact method. Okay, so that's how that is generated. I can also add this to hold slips. There is a line of code that we can put in there. Um, so for all of y'all that we've worked with, um, where we've done some, you know, kind of fancy stuff to get that to show on to your hold slip. There's a much better way to do that now. So feel free to open a ticket and we'll be happy to go ahead and um, let you and work with you on that one. That's a really good question, Amy, of if that is going to show up on the hold pop up. Um, Kelly, do you happen to know offhand if that does? That's right. I don't think it did when I was testing something else out, but. Yeah, I would go with it probably doesn't, but let's double check it just real quick. I believe it goes with the um, contact method in the enhanced messaging preferences. nothing on there for that one so um but is that the best one because it says patrons not notified yeah i who knows <laughs> we'll dig into that a little bit more and see what we can figure out um so maureen's question is can is this something the patron can choose in self-registration um and i believe it can be done in self-registration yes no anybody tried that Again, great questions. We're, we'll follow up and find out and get those answers for y'all um, if that can be done in self-registration. So, okay, but again, very exciting to have that there. Um, and again, you know, this is how these comments that we're getting are how we make it better. So what we do with these sorts of things is we go back to the community, we try, we figure it out. If it doesn't do that, then we go ahead and file a bug to say, hey, it would be great to be able to have this as part of the enhancement also. So we continue building and making Koha better and better as we go. Donna, self-registration does include the main contact method. Awesome. Yay. Uh, is this consortium wide or a single library decision when you put in a ticket? Um, so this is going to be there by default. Um, so it's just kind of there. Everyone has it. Um, you can decide whether you use it or not, though. Okay. Um, and if you want it in your holds notices or in your notices, those can be customized by location. So it can be a single branch that puts that in there. Um, other locations don't have to. Okay. Another exciting one, and again, it's the little things that make me happy. Um, when we used to look at our patrons, there was a difference between what we saw on the details page and the checkout page as far as the notices that showed 
where they showed and the order they showed in. So what uh, bug 27873 has done is it went ahead and just put a standardization to them. So it has gone ahead and made them consistent um, with some of the more important ones towards the top and then going down to the, to the quote, lesser important ones with like the messages and things like that. But now you will see these in an expected order. And so this should just make it a little bit easier for staff. They know where to look, it's gonna be consistent. You don't have to look at different places. It's all gonna be, in that one spot together um, in those different or in that same order. So again, just a nice little functionality there. One of the other things that have been changed here is your permissions. OK, so under our borrower permissions, which is add, modify and view patron information, delete patrons has been separated out now. So this is now its own independent uh, permission. In the typical method of COHA, um, we don't change things that are already set usually. So like for permissions, what that means is that everyone that had the permission that was previously edit borrowers will now have the delete borrowers permission also. So that will be automatically set for them. So if there are staff members that shouldn't have that delete patrons permission, you will need to go in there and update that and remove it from them. But by default, if they had those edit borrower permissions before, they will have that delete um, patrons permission as they move over to 2111. Okay. All right. Um, next up, transfer changes. So in the past, when you checked in items, you would get that transfer message, but then it would kind of just disappear. Now on our check-in screen, we'll be able to have a new column that shows that transfer information. So we can see here um, that this item, Phoebe and her unicorn, belongs to the East Branch, and I need to go ahead and transfer it to the East Branch. So we have this new column here that's showing me exactly what to do. Okay, um, And some people say, well, you saw the home library, but that doesn't always hold true. So for instance, if I check in this item, Okay. Um, we can see here that this belongs to the home library and actually needs to be sent over to the East branch for a hold. So um, this transfer to is going to make it really, really clear as you're kind of flying through getting all your books checked in. If you've forgotten which one that which bin this needs to go into, you'll be able to see that on your check in screen of where that item needs to be sent to for the transfer. So again, little enhancement, but definitely going to be um, helpful as far as figuring things out. Okay. Now this one, this is bug 29519. And the title of the bug is one should be able to resolve a claim return at check in. This is something that we have been asking for since claims return was released, gosh, year and a half, two years ago, I guess by now, somewhere around there. So now when I check in an item, I get the messages that I used to see, but I also have a new little magic button here that says this item has been claimed as returned by Howard and I can go ahead and resolve it from here. So if I click on this button, it goes ahead and gives me that resolves pop up that we're used to seeing. I have all of my options and I can go ahead and resolve my claim. So now when I look at Howard's account, we will see that his claim has been cleared. Um, this is a, a new little enhancement <laughs> also, is that it only shows you active claims on their claims tab by default. So it's very easy to see and separate the old ones from the new ones. And so if I wanna see all of them, I can go ahead and click on that. It shows me that reserved. Oh, Amy, where can we mark an item as claims returned? That is a system preference that we will need to set up. It's a lost status. But on the patrons checkout screens, there should be, once it is set up right, you'll have a claim return column. Um, we do have blog posts about that if you want to look it up, or um, you can go ahead and just let us know and we'll work with you on setting that up. But claims return is a really handy functionality to have that one. Um, but yeah, being able to uh, resolve that claim on check-in is, is fantastic. Now, something to be aware of is that um, we, we had a comment the other day that um, not everybody at the library can is supposed to resolve claims returned. So what you can do, though, is you still have that option of when you check it in, you don't have to resolve it. You can just leave it as it is. 
um, it has been checked in. And so you can just go ahead and put it to the side and whoever needs to deal with that claim return can then deal with it. So you don't have to resolve it, but it is that option now to go ahead and have that resolved. So nice little shortcut to help uh, what we're looking for or to help get those things fixed. Okay, so our next bug is 22435. Clarify account offset types by converting them to clear codes. We don't need any explanation of this, right? Okay, so um, account offsets are basically any changes to an account balance. So somebody made a payment, you then voided that payment, uh, they made another payment, the fine went up, a lost book came back. All of those things are account offset changes. Um, and previously, if you were trying to recreate that breadcrumb trail of what happened, um, you kind of had to dig into the details and take a guess at what the sequence of events. Um, what this one changes is you can see the entire sequence of events when the fine was created, so it increased. When a payment was applied, it decreased. When another payment was applied, it decreased. That, that was voided, so it went up. So you see that nice clear sequence of events without having to play Nancy Drew. Um, and you could still click into each individual account line um, details page to see more about it. But the nice sequential layout of this is the fine and this is its history um, is a big simplification. The, uh, the flip side to that is a lot of your cash register reports um, also deal with account offsets. So we probably fixed up a bunch of reports for you um, with the upgrade to 2105 where we had to change what the account offset type was. So we would have said um, payment or offset type in payment and credit applied. Um, now we just need to go back into your report and make sure that account offset type is apply. Um, everything else in your report should, should still work exactly as, as it used to. Um, this is the only tweak that needs to be made. So if you're comfortable getting into reports and making changes, it's a really simple fix. Um, if you don't want to mess with that at all, put in a ticket. One of us will fix it for you. Okay, let me stop my share. Awesome. Uh, well, you have made Amy very happy. Um, so awesome. Um, is the accounting history retrospective or only presented in this lovely way after the upgrade? I think it's only going to... So I know from the, the back end, it, ch it changes to apply. Um, I haven't looked at an old fine transaction uh, from the front end. Let me see if I can find one. I would think it would be retrospective labeling, basically, right? Mm -hmm. I, I believe so. I, I'll have to check. Yeah. So it'll make it less of a challenge, Amy. I loved the dot, dot, dot challenge description about account lines. Um, and that is definitely, definitely there. Um, okay, and then we had a question about the resolved of claims returned and Kelly uh, went ahead and put a blog post in there about how to go ahead and set up that report to see those. Um, so awesome. All right. Okay, um, so our next bug, 29015, is one of those that I do, it's one of the ones I feel obligated to pause for. Holds Q, y'all look, I can now filter my Holds Q. Sweetie, you're, sweetie, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, no. right I know, I know, you might want to go through the pause thing again. There we go, okay. So we can pause as we all look at this now. Look at this, <laughs> look at this, y'all. Item type, collection, shelving location. So for all of y'all that export your holds queue as a CSV and then put it into Excel and break it up for all of your staff to do stuff with, you don't have to do that anymore. You can come in here and run it the way that you need to. So for instance, if I have um, a staff member that all they do is the fiction collection, I can come in here, go ahead and hit fiction. They have a very short list today, but it's only the one item that they need to go ahead and pull off of here. So again, this holds queue is um, really fantastic to be able to limit to any of your or all of those. So you can get really specific with that. 
Um, so this is just those fiction collections that I need to be able to go and pull, or I can go ahead again and just, you know, use all combinations of these. So really a fantastic, fantastic addition to um, the Holds Cube updates that you can go ahead and uh, get those filtered down a whole lot more. So, okay. Next up, we have a bug that has been sponsored by Bedford Public Library, Huntsville Madison Public Library, and Los Gatos, and that's 23678, and that's cancel holds in bulk. So when I am in a bib record now, and I go into my holds section, I now have little checkity boxes that will work with this cancel selected option. So I can come in here and say, you know what? She's not going to get the book. He's not going to get the book. He's not going to get the book for whatever reason. There's legitimate reasons. I'm not just being mean, Kelly. I can see your face. But I can go ahead and just select multiple um, patrons on that list, hit that cancel selected option, and confirm the cancellation of those holds. Um, so they've now, they will have been removed from that list. So um, again, just a nice little makes your life a little bit easier sort of thing that you can come in here instead of having to do one by one, you can go ahead and group them and cancel those holds as needed. Um, this is something that um, is a, a new functionality where we have things running in the background, but you'll see a little bit more about that um, in just a few minutes. Okay, last but not least, I call this the Kelly enhancement. This is bug 28819. If y'all have noticed from the home page here, we now have a link for item search. <laughs> love this, love this, love this. Um, item search, as y'all know, used to only be available from the search drop down here. Um, it is such a powerful tool. I'm so happy to see it now on this home page where you can access it. And if you have not used item search yet, you are seriously missing out on it. Um, when I first started you know, learning about Koha, I was like, yeah, who's going to use that? And then Kelly showed me the error of my ways, and it is one of the best tools in here. It is so incredibly helpful for so many different things that you're doing. So, And we could do like an entire two-hour webinar just on item search. So I'll stop there. Um, okay, and have I double-checked? Um, the old fine history does show the new sequential order of offsets. So hallelujah, it's going to make going back and looking at all that stuff so much easier. All right, so that's really kind of my section on patrons and circulation. Again, little things, but things that I think uh, your staff are going to be really, really excited about. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our uh, technical services expert, Kelly. Um, far from that, <laughs> Donna, really. Um, but I will cover what's in the technical services section for 2111, which is super fun. Not a ton of cataloging, but quite a few enhancements to tools. So for all those that use the tools within Koha, I did put a link to the technical services blog that shows all the features and enhancements and links out to any respective blog posts and more information. The first one in the agenda I will cover is the renaming of the news tool. So if we remember past Koha, we use the news tool to communicate within the staff client and the OPAC. So little staff information and also for the OPAC. Then a few versions later, we decided, hey, wouldn't it be great if we also threw some OPAC customizations into that news tool? Um, Sarah paused and did not go too far into two system preferences, also moving over to the tool as well. So your OPAC, uh, Remind me what they are, OPAC. OPAC and OPAC nav bottom. OPAC nav and OPAC nav bottom, which are leaving our system preference um, hub and moving over to what we are now calling the HTML customizations. So here we are, we're in the tools section within Koha, and now we have our news 
and we've broken out those HTML customizations. So if we look at news, we're going back in time and actually only having the ability within the news tool to do that customizations of like giving notices on the staff click staff interface or the OPAC interface as well as the slip. So this is going back in time and saying this is what it was primarily used for and it's all going to stay here. We then also changed it to have a separate area to go for your HTML customizations. So if I go to a new entry, you'll see all those that we've slowly moved from the global system preferences over to this. So this is really helpful to know they have been separated. Everything will copy over to its respective area. So if you do have things in your news um, that's for your staff interface or your OPAC, that will stay there with the upgrade. And anything that you had for your HTML customizations will also stay. The one thing to note is there was a system preference change for this. Um, it's not a system preference that I've gone to very often, but it used to be called the news tool editor. And now it's called the additional, if I can spell, contents editor. And this is really just asking libraries globally if you would like to edit these two tools using the WYSIWYG or the text editor. And does anyone want to guess what WYSIWYG stands for? And I'm always saying it wrong. Somebody corrected me probably three upgrade webinars ago. So I'm saying it wrong, I know. WYSIWYG. There you go. Say, I knew I was saying it wrong. WYSIWYG. And it's my motto, what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. So that's going to give you that nice little um, options of like, bold and italics and underline where the text editor would be just a blank text box. Okay. Good job. Good job, everybody. We got quite a few people who knew that. That's smart. Um, for more information, it does default to WYSIWYG, um, but you can convert it if you would like. Good question. Okay, so we'll pop back over to the tools as this is where we're mainly going to hang out in our section. We're going to talk about patron imports and a new feature that allows fields to be protected when patrons are imported or re-imported. So for those that are importing patrons within Koha, that lives in your tools under import patrons. And we have a new option here in this document or form in that says preserve existing values. So this will allow you to save the information of a borrower when you're importing information that could possibly overwritten. So there are libraries that update patron information year to year, semester to semester. And if you wanna preserve something in that, you would go ahead and click which field to be preserved from the original patron record. There's a handy dandy blog post on this for those libraries that feel as though this might be really handy to your workflow and not worry about getting things um, rewritten and you wanna keep that information. So we do, it's a lot of academics like Karen um, is coming from UCC. This is a feature that academics and those K through 12 libraries will really appreciate. Hi, Karen. Um, the next feature, I'm gonna pop back over to tools. The next feature is the, I don't know why I'm popping back over to tools. The next feature is the ability to use your mark modification templates on a single record. So for anyone who has built a mark modification template, which lives within the tools module, which is the driving force when you do modifications to mark records. If you wanna remove, copy, delete, um, those are the functionalities of a mark modification template. Before now, 
to apply a mark modification to your mark records, you would do that in batch. You would use that batch record modification and you would apply that template to make those changes, or you could do it when you imported a file of records. Now in 2111, you have the ability to do that from a single record. So I'm gonna pull up a single record and from the edit drop down menu, you now have a new option called modify record using template. If you click that, you'll see I'm transported back to the tools module and I'm given the option to say, hey, this is the one record you wanna modify. And then you're going to apply your mark modification template to it. And you'll do it at this um, easy one click kind of thing. This makes me happy as well, Amy. I'm glad you're happy as I'm happy. One thing that I know Sarah is gonna talk about when she gets into admin is this, you know, background jobs that are being run. You, you will see new kind of boxes of information that says, hey, this is being sent off to the queue to be processed. You can always click to see that process. I'm running one record. It's pretty much instantaneously. And I can see that detailed job if I wanted to. I can easily go back or, oh, oh, that's nice. I don't know if that's new. Add modified records to a list. Anyways, that could be always there. I don't know. So this is the ability to use that mark modification template from a single bib record, which is pretty fantastic. We did a, um, I know maybe it's new, maybe Andrew's, he, he likes it too, maybe it's not, it's not not new, maybe it's new. Um, for more information about that um, feature, you can see our Monday Minutes, which I've put into the blog post, into the chat, sorry. Yeah, maybe it's just been not noticeable. Probably one of the largest features within the technical services section in 2111 is the ability to protect mark fields based on source of import. So if you were bringing in mark records and potentially overlaying or overwriting that information, and you wanted to protect a specific local field, you now have the ability to do that. Oddly, this does not live in the tools section. It lives in admin. If I head over to the administration module, I have a new option that's called record overlay rules. The, the functionality of this is fantastic because in my imagination, this was going to be solely for when you imported records. Maybe you had a little stub record, you added some details to it, and then you got your full record from a vendor or you, you know, replaced it with a Z39.50 record. Now you can do that regardless of how you're, you know, bringing it in and you can identify that within these overlay rules. So we go into depth into our Monday minutes about this. Andrew also joins us. We miss you, Andrew, during this Monday minutes where we really talk about this grid and how you can apply this grid and the different rules that can go along with it. You can go as simple as to say all these library, um, this patron category called library staff can protect or overwrite this specific mark field or you can say um, this module user category, username, like, which I love, how those records are being adjusted. So whether that's through batch record modification, through the staff client, just editing a record, mark import Z39.50, and this suspicious import Lexile.pl won't go, won't go close to that one the specific mark fields that you are talking about and that rule itself. So if you're allowing somebody to add new, the rest of the columns will fill out by default what it believes you would want to do, but you can of course change those as well. These, I don't know, in the last few releases, we're getting little um, tool tips, I think they're called, these little eyes, which I love because it's great to be able to hover and be able to say, what do you mean by added? And I can see exactly what 
Koha wants me to see without maybe popping over to the manual to find that little bit of information. So really, as you start to, I've brought this to your attention, you'll now see um, the ability to get more tool tips within Koha, which I like. This is a pretty complex feature. So please feel free if this is something you're interested in, watch our Monday minutes, which I'm going to put in right now. And then reach out to us and we're happy to help work with you on this because this is not something you just turn on or turn off. You would probably need a little guidance. Um, Sarah dug through. Um, the add modified records to the list was part of 2105. Um, and I thought I had seen it there before, but I wasn't sure enough to say that. But I think what's happening is because now we're seeing it in a different format, we're seeing it on the, um, the queue, it's a little bit more obvious to us. So yeah, but there's a lot of changes there with that one. Um, and so Kelly, so with this mark overlay rules, I know it's rather involved. And like you said, we need to have some conversations with it. But I also think we want to put the call out there for people that be willing to really kind of let us know how they're using it. This is kind of the first shot at a new feature. So we'd really like to get some feedback on what's going to make it better, um, things like that. And then just as another little side note, so we keep talking about it. I don't think we've actually told everyone that's on the call here. So as you all know, um, we had another educator, Andrew, um, who is absolutely the amazing Andrew. Um, and he was uh, or has the opportunity to become the assistant director of his hometown library um, in Iowa. So he went ahead and followed his heart. I don't know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so he's no longer an educator with Bywater, but he is one of our partners, which is why he is here. So um, as we keep talking about that, I just want to let everyone know that, that like, it's not like we abandoned him or anything or got rid of him, but he went ahead and became a local, uh, a local assistant director. So anyways, sorry, I just wanted to jump in with all of that. And uh, Kelly, I know you have more to go still. Yep. One last thing to talk about with this new feature, the mark um, overlay rules, there is a system, sorry, there is a permission attached with this. So to be able to modify or add new rules, you would need to give an employee the manage mark overlay rules, which is found in admin. So it is a new feature, a new line item, and also a permission. I believe this is my last one, and it's about logs. So within Koha, Koha can log actions within the modules of Koha, and they're really helpful. By default, we can hold these logs for 180 days and you're able to say who did what when through these logs. The one thing Koha has started to do is log more for people, for libraries, because they wanted to see more changes and be able to track these changes. So we're gonna start in the administration section just to see where you turn on logs, but because by default, these will not be turned on for you. So this acquisition log is new. You would need to make sure you wanted to track these acquisition changes. And we need to do that within the global system preferences. Um, most of the time with these upgrade features, if there is something you need to, Koha is going to stay as pretty um, consistent from upgrade to upgrade. And it would be your responsibility to say, I like that, I wanna turn that on. So this is one of those features. If I turn, go over to the left and just click that tab that says logs, I can see all the logs that I can potentially turn on or off within the system. So there are things that I don't have turned on, such as the ILL log, news log. Those are changes that are made to my news tool and the content. I think that's pretty important. Um, but if I don't have it on, I won't. it won't log those changes. So here we have acquisition log. I am logging those. And that's good to note. If you're not sure what Koha is logging without going into the system preferences and popping over to the log viewer in the tools module, you'll actually see what Koha is not logging. You have little exclamation points in a triangle. And that tells me that these in fact are not being logged so I can't actually access any of that information because it's not there. If you turn on a log, it will only log the changes from that moment on in the future. So it's not gonna be a retroactive log. It did not capture those changes until it has been turned on. If I click over to, instead of looking at all the modules, I can look at acquisition and there's quite a few changes that have been um, added to these logs for this purpose. 
when somebody creates an acquisition basket, when somebody modifies one, when they modify the header, when they modify the users, when they close a basket, all these are being logged within the system. If you've ever used the logs in other areas of Koha, you'll know that there are some details such as what goes in which option. So if I wanted to look at a specific vendor or a specific basket, I would potentially use this object and in info. The blog post I'm linking in the chat, Andrew goes into lots of detail in what goes where. I'm always a big um, log viewer of just saying, well, I kind of just want to see everything that goes along with modifying a fund and I can submit I can, of course, do dates, but for those larger libraries, you probably want to narrow that down a bit. But here you can see when I click to say, just show me everything that has to do with modifying funds, I will be able to see those log entries, date and time, who did it, the module, the action, and then the information, which this is telling me that my budget did change $5,000. It originally was, let me scroll over, 25,000 and it went up to 30,000. And then lastly, it can tell, tell me where it happened. Most likely it always will change on the interface as it is a, it is a staff interface uh, module. So this will be really helpful to libraries out there. If you weren't logging all the things and now you're like, oh, let's log all the things. I don't even use acquisition, but I didn't know I could log all the things. You have the power of the logs and now you know where you can turn them on or turn them off and also run them. That's my last one. Does anyone have any technical services questions? So Kelly, can you explain to me the purpose of RDA? <laughs> <laughs> or you didn't mean like that <laughs> no i didn't but okay. rda is well and, and fine in the koha system it works it's there for all those that love it love it some more <laughs> awesome thank you kelly for taking that on so moving into our last section now sarah we're going to wrap up with some really exciting things in administration but i know like you said there's not really much to show for some of these but they're really cool so <laughs> Yeah, um, for these, they, they are some really great enhancements, but there's not a whole lot to put on display for them. So I'll get my screen shared. Okay. All right. So um, the first one that we've got is uh, it's a couple of them that work together. So there's 28445. Um, which is using the task queue for batch delete um, and batch modification of items, and then 29020, um, missing background jobs link in admin home. Um, so with uh, 2105, uh, you could access background jobs. So this is 2105 version. You could access background jobs, but only by pasting in the URL um, or going directly from a job that um, used the task queue. So um, this is the view for 2105. If I go over to administration, you'll see there is no way to get to background jobs from here. Um, but the nice change in 2111 is that if I go here to administration, I've got a link to manage background jobs. Um, so this is going to, uh, it's an easier way to access all of the background jobs that um, have been running. Um, and I think this is because the link was not, it was harder to access um, or less intuitive to access. The batch, um, as was mentioned in the chat, the batch record modification, um, the ability to add that to a list was available in 2105, but since this whole module or uh, part of administration was not um, super easy to access, I think it just was not um, anything that many of us realized. Um, so um, having that more accessible is nice because from here, you can see um, the time that jobs were queued, started, ended, um, and then you can also go back and view old jobs. So I can, for instance, 
go back to view um, a batch item um, modification. And so the other part of this change is that batch um, item modification and deletion were added to the task queue, which means that they now show up in this list of background jobs. Um, so previously, if I went and ran a batch item modification, Add a note here. Um, so I now have a link to view the detail of the NQ job, um, which give me a table that will look familiar to running batch item modifications in 2105. Um, the difference is now um, that if I go to that whole job list, I can then return to that batch item record modification after the fact. Uh, if I want to go and view this one, for instance, I can look at that same table. Um, previously, since, ba since batch item record mod batch item modifications were not part of the task queue, once you navigated away from this results screen, you had no way to get back to it. So it's a nice way to be able to um, see um, more information about what was done um, after the fact. Um, and in addition, there's um, batch item um, deletion is now part of that background jobs list as well. Um, the other new um, type of job that is on that is batch record deletion. So there's not as much detail, of course, because the record is not there, but you can see whether things were deleted successfully or not. Um, so that can be handy as well. Um, so the link here on administration um, is controlled by a system preference called manage background jobs, or pardon me, not a system preference, a permission. Um, so if I hop on over to my permissions. So this account has super librarian functions, but otherwise it would be the manage background jobs um, permission. That is what puts that link on um, the administration page. Uh, but the other part of this is that for someone who does not have that permission, um, so this account, I'm in a different account now, um, this person does not have that managed background. They only have access to the administration module, um, but you can see here that they can access their own background job. So that is a new addition as well. So people can go back and see what they did. Um, so it gives a little bit more access, but while still um, controlling um, who is able to see everything. All right. Um, any questions about that one coming in? No, okay. Um, all right, so the next couple of um, enhancements are have less to show. Uh, so the first one is 18631, um, which is cleanup database should take an option for modules in action logs. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, oh, I'm gonna get out of this one. Um, as Kelly mentioned, um, logs by default are kept at for 180 days. Um, so what this um, enhancement does is it adds an option to um, add parameters basically to the crons, to the cleanup database cron that cleans up logs. So the one is called log modules, um, including that in the cron will clean only the cron that you name um, and leave all the others as is. So you could set, you could say, for instance, that you want circulation to be cleaned after 90 days and you want everything else to be preserved for that full 180. Um, the other part of this is preserve log. Um, so if you add, if that is added to the cron, then only the log named would be preserved and everything else will be cleaned. Um, so depending on what you want preserved, what you want cleaned, and on what schedule, you have got, now have a lot more flexibility um, for how things are preserved or cleaned. Um, and that does not lend itself to showing much, um, but it can be really useful for keeping your logs in cleaner order. Um, 
we then have um, cleanup database, another one for cleanup database. It is 25429. Um, cleanup database should remove resolved claims after uh, returned after X number of days. Um, so this one, yes. Um, so this brings a new system preference called cleanup database return claims. So you can have your number of days in here. Um, this is run again by cleanup database. And so what this will do is as it says remove uh, returns that have returned claims that have been resolved after however many days you've got here. Um, so in my little fake account right now, for instance, I have four claims that have been resolved. Um, and so what this would do is after 20 days after they have been resolved, it would remove them here. Uh, and the nice other part of this is that it works together um, with claim return warning threshold, um, because the only issue with this system preference is that it looks at total number of claims, whether or not they're resolved which makes it a little bit less useful because if I've got four claims, that's not, you don't necessarily need this warning here. Um, but if these are auto, if the four resolved claims are automatically being removed after X number of days, this can um, be a little bit more useful because it hopefully will only indicate the claims that are actually still active. Uh, all right, and then finally, this one doesn't have a lot to show, um, but it is 28456, uh, adding the option to use a where statement in the membership expiry cron job, um, which um, is the cron job that sends um, emails to patrons when their accounts are about to expire. Um, so previously it was set by system preference for a number of days and all patrons would get that notification by email. Um, but what this allows you to do is add where statements based on columns in the borrowers table um, to target subsets of your patron base. So you could say, for instance, that you want to send this notification only to patrons with a certain branch code. Um, or you could say that you want to send it only to patrons, um, that you want to exclude one specific um, category code from that notification. Like if you don't want to send it to self-registered patrons because they need to come in and get their card, um, get their full card within 15 days and the notification goes out um, at 15 days. It could be confusing for them to get uh, multiple kind of sources of information. So I'm here in the 2111 database schema. Um, I'll put this in the chat, uh, but any, um, columns in this table can be used to target those where the uh, membership expiry cron to send it only to that subset of your patrons. And I know that that's something a lot of our partners have asked for. So we, I'm expecting to see some tickets from y'all uh, to say, hey, we, we need to update our patron register or patron expiration. So fantastic. Um, we did have a, a follow up question from Amy um, and Andrew has a uh, has kind of re re uh, responded. Um, it's what's the value in keeping the resolved claims returned. Um, what we do see is a lot of uh, libraries um, try to use it or use it to try to identify patterns um, for patrons that are, for instance, as Andrew said, trying to dodge late fines. Um, you know, so knowing that there's a pattern of, oh yeah, I returned all, I, I claimed all twelve items as returned. Oh, they were magically all found in the library, um, and just kind of seeing that happen every few months or something like that. So. Um, just being able to kind of keep aware of what's happening with those sorts of things. Although I could also argue that your staff knows who those patrons are anyways, um, even without the, the resolved ones kept. So uh, since we're fine free, is there another use to keep the info? Honestly, I would say no. As long as you know, as long as those items are coming back, um, that's kind of my philosophy with it. Um, so we did have an uh, and the library says that they had a patron that put their books back on the shelf and kept saying that she returned them. So that would be a good use of seeing that there is again, a pattern for those sorts of things. So um, it really is just trying to help staff identify um, any sort of uh, issues that they're, they might be experiencing. So trying to be polite, am I, am I succeeding? <laughs> awesome, all right. So again, 
no huge changes, but a lot of really small ones that are very, very helpful. Um, so Michael asked about the hold reminder patron messaging preference. Um, we did not cover that in this one. Um, it is in one of the blog posts. Um, it is so y'all know that there's that in the last release, there was the um, patron messaging excuse me, the hold reminder that was added, um, that has now been added as a patron messaging preference so that patrons can go ahead and um, decide how they want to get that hold reminder notice or if they don't want to get it at all. So that has been added to that. That is covered in one of the blog posts that we have about that one. Um, and again, by default, it is not going to be on. So if you do want your patrons to be able to choose their patron messaging preference you or, or to, if you want to set that by default you will need to go ahead and do that and then we can go ahead and push that information needed um and andrew that is that is correct we could always go the other way and say well a lot of claims a lot of resolved claims returns that were found on shelf meant that i need to talk to my staff about their check-in process the other thing is if you want to keep some of that history is you still have like the notes fields Yes, um, you could like still my old, old libraries I've worked at use those fields yeah. that, to document like, hey, they said they claims returned it, update that note and brought it back. Um, and Julia, your your point about the um, information in the title column, that has something that's come up a few different times. Um, and we have libraries that say, please do not change anything that's in that title column of the holds queue. I need all of that bibliographic information there. And then we probably have just as many libraries that are saying, please get rid of all that stuff. Um, so that um, is something that I think we probably do have bugs on in the community. Um, we'll see if we can find those. And if not, that's something we probably should start as a conversation in the community um, about being able to do those sorts of things um, and decide what information you want on there. I foresee that coming um, because we are expanding um, the columns, uh, the table settings um, processes in there where we're controlling things more and more in those tables and going to head and um, making those more customizable. So I would say that that probably is coming, but we'll definitely follow up on that one. So awesome, awesome. All right. So Sarah posted the, uh, the link where these recordings will be. Um, and if you wanted to see our session from Tuesday where we told jokes at the beginning, you can go ahead and view that one. <laughs> Kelly's like, why would you do that? Uh, <laughs> Um, so, uh, what we'll, again, in two weeks, we'll have the Q and A sessions. You can go ahead and take a look at that, uh, our demo site. If you don't have a test site that hasn't been upgraded, um, to see that 2111, all of the documentation is available there too. And again, even if you haven't had the opportunity to explore 2111, you are still welcome to come to the Q and A and ask any questions about anything that's on those release notes or our blog posts. Kelly, thank you for your guest appearance. We greatly appreciate it. Heba, thank you for jumping in with your first upgrade blurb. Well done. Um, and uh, on behalf of Bywater, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.